I want to ask you to grab a Bible and open it with me to the book of 2 Corinthians, chapter 12. And as you turn, you may have heard the story of the local bar patrons who were so sure that their bartender was the strongest man around that they offered a standing $1,000 bet. The bartender would squeeze a lemon until all of the juice ran out into a glass and the lemon would have no more. Anyone who could squeeze just one more drop of juice out of the lemon would win the $1,000. And many people had tried. Longshoremen, weightlifters, firefighters, they all failed. One day a short, thin, balding little man came into the bar wearing a thick black rimmed glasses and a double knit polyester suit and he announced to the bartender in a faint, tiny, squeaky little voice, I'd like to try the bet. And after the laughter had died down in the bar, the bartender said, okay. And he grabbed the lemon and he squeezed away. And as he squeezed drip after drip after drip all the way until this lemon was dry and wrinkled in its remains, he handed it over to the little man. And the man clinched his small fist around the lemon and the crowd's laughter continued on until all of a sudden laughter turned into total silence as one drop fell into the glass below. And then another, and then another. Six drops in total. And as the crowd cheered, the bartender handed over $1,000 in cash to this little man, but he asked him, what do you do for a living? You're obviously not a lumberjack or a weightlifter. And an almost imperceptible smile came over the man's face, and he replied in a quiet and satisfied voice, I'm an accountant for the IRS. Accountants, they find a way. An accountant is one who works for a business or a corporation and they take record of all of the movement of currency coming in and going out of the business. Good businesses hire an accountant to make sure that what is spent is spent properly and what comes in is as it should be. Without an accountant, a business could misallocate its resources. An accountant is there to make sure that those resources, that currency is allocated according to plan. And that's a really important job. As you turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, the Apostle Paul is doing some accounting. He addresses an accusation that the Corinthians have against him, that he is trying to leech off of them, that when he is with them, that he is taking from them. And Paul is addressing the accounting of this by mentioning that there is a currency that needs to be properly allocated but this is not the currency of money. It's a currency of life. And he wants to make sure that he is doing, allocating this currency as he should, and that all of those who are following Christ would do the same, that they would allocate the currency of their life in a particular way, because doing so would mean and point to the fact that the ministry that is happening is truly authentic in its nature. But a failure to allocate this currency accurately would point to a ministry that is not authentic. And so let's see what he says about that in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, starting at verse 11. He says this. He says, I've been a fool. You forced me to it. For I ought to have been commended by you, for I was not at all inferior to these super apostles, even though I am nothing. 
The signs of a true apostle were performed among you with utmost patience, with signs and wonders and mighty works. For in what were you less favored than the rest of the churches, except that I myself did not burden you? Forgive me this wrong. Here for a third time I am ready to come to you, and I will not be a burden, for I seek not what is yours, but you. For children are not obligated to save up for their parents, but parents for their children. I will most gladly spend and be spent for your souls. If I love you more, am I to be loved less? But granting that I myself did not burden you, I was crafty, you say, and got the better of you by deceit. Did I take advantage of you through any of those whom I sent to you? I urged Titus to go and sent the brother with him. Did Titus take advantage of you? Did we not act in the same spirit? Did we not take the same steps? Have you been thinking all along that we have been defending ourselves to you? It is in the sight of God that we have been speaking in Christ and all for your upbuilding, beloved. For I fear that perhaps when I come, I may find you not as I wish and that you may find me not as you wish, that perhaps there may be quarreling and jealousy and anger and hostility, slander, gossip, conceit, and disorder. I fear that when I come again, my God may humble me before you and I may have to mourn over many of those who sinned earlier and have not repented of the impurity, sexual immorality, and sensuality that they have practiced. Paul is writing to show the Corinthians the nature of authentic gospel ministry in the midst of those who are promoting an alternative gospel. And at the beginning of this section in verses 11 through 13, he solidifies the defense of his apostleship by reminding them of the actions that he had done among them despite their physical weakness. He is not inferior to the so-called super apostles, he says. In fact, those who had been promoting themselves as superior were not able to do the things that Paul was able to do. He reminds him that he had performed signs and wonders and mighty works among them. And one scholar says it this way, signs authenticated the message, wonders evoked awe, and mighty works manifested divine power. These miracles that Paul performed displayed God's power in the midst of weakness. And he didn't do so in a way that would overwhelm them. He was patient with them in the midst of their opposition to him. And so he moves to tell them of his motives in coming to them for a third time. And it's really quite astonishing that he says I'm about ready to come to you for a third time because as we've talked about and as we've gone through the book together the ministry that Paul has done among them has very mixed results. (laughs) I mean you have some people who've put their faith in Christ and they're following him faithfully. You have some people who are opposed to the gospel and you have other people who are opposed to Paul himself so much so that they've accused him of taking from them, not charging for the public speaking that he's doing, but rather collecting an offering and then skimming off the top for his own personal gain. They've accused him of being like Judas, who took money out of the disciples' money bag for himself when no one was looking. And when you're faced with that kind of accusation, if it's not true, most people would probably throw up their hands and say, fine, if you don't want what I'm giving you, but you're going to continue to malign my character, I will just go to the next group of people that will receive the gospel that I'm preaching and leave you on your own. But Paul doesn't do that. Even in the middle of all this difficulty, he continues to go back to them. And in doing so, he reveals his true motives. They are the motives, the true motives for anybody in ministry. They're the motives not just for an apostle. 
They're the motives for anybody who is a follower of Jesus who understands the things of greatest consequence and the magnitude of Christ's work in their life. And he communicates these motives in a language of spending and saving, in a language of currency. He communicates these motives in the language of accounting. <laughs> and he says so in verse 14, I seek not what is yours, but you. I know that some of you have accused my motives of trying to steal your money, but I don't want something from you. I want you. Seeking people is the true motive for ministry. Friends, that's so important to recognize for a variety of reasons. It's important to recognize in ourselves and it's important to recognize in those who are ministering to us or with us. And I think it's important for at least three reasons. The first is that it helps us to evaluate or examine our own motives. Because there have been plenty of examples throughout history of people who have illustrated a shift in motives through the years. They start off well in serving the Lord. They communicate well the things of God. They have a genuine love and desire for people. But as time goes on and they gain a foothold or an influence in the lives of others, they end up just getting a little off track. And what initially becomes was good now becomes self-serving in its nature. They use their influence for the benefit of themselves. And that's why we're told again and again to examine ourselves, lest we fall prey to the same temptation of wanting to take from other people. But the second thing that this helps us, this, this expression helps us to understand, is the importance of remaining teachable. Because... True ministry motives are important, and when you see that they are, and you come across something that you hear in your life from a gospel worker who's teaching the word of God to you, something that you do not like, if you trust their motives, then it's easier for you to remain teachable, to not get confused about whether or not trying to take from you or not. The Corinthians were confused about this. They were confused about the motives and they were confused about what was happening after and hence the accusation. But, you know, I understand, friends, as somebody who teaches the Bible regularly, that the Bible confronts us, it confronts me, it confronts you all the time with things that we might not like to hear. Things that if we are not teachable, we will immediately shut down and just say, I'm not interested anymore. That's why the scriptures talk about itself in this way. Hebrews 4.12 says, The word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit or joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. What does that mean? It means that there are some times when we read or hear or teach the word of God that we are pierced by it in such a way that is not immediately enjoyable to us. And in those moments... When you trust the motives, pure motives of the one who is teaching it, you have a decision to make. Will I remain teachable even when it hurts and conform myself to the scripture or will I remain unteachable and expect the scripture to conform to me? And Paul says, I'm not here because I want something from you. <laughs> I want you. I want you to know God. I want you to experience all of the benefit that comes by following him with your life. 
I want you to know what a fullness of God looks like in your daily, weekly, monthly, yearly experience. I want you. And the third thing that this little phrase helps us to see, it helps us in accounting for that of greatest value. Paul points to the fact that when you understand the hierarchy of true value and ultimate worth in the human life, that it would be absurd to think that he would want something from them. That's not that valuable (laughs) when he could have them. Things are utterly subordinate to Life and being and the will and the mind and your heart, those are the things of greatest importance. Things are subordinate to that. I know a lot of people say they believe that, but when it comes down to it, a great number less actually function like they believe that. Friends, if you want to serve Jesus with your life, then let people be the goal. (laughs) Paul communicates this motive for ministry in a lot of different places throughout the New Testament. My favorite one is in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. He says to this other church, so being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves because you had become very dear to us. And then just a few verses later, he goes on to say in verses 19 and 20, what is our hope or our joy or our crown of boasting before our Lord Jesus at his coming? What are the things that we could give to the king of the universe as he returns? What is the one thing that will make him happy with us? Is it not you? (laughs) You are our glory and our joy. Serving God means you give yourself first to the Lord and in doing so, you give yourself to other people seeking their very souls for God. And the reason why Paul did that and the reason why you can do it is because you understand the hierarchy of value and worth. Things are subordinate. (laughs) But people are infinitely more valuable. And so Paul displays his motive. And he displays that his motive is not just talk, but that true ministry has actions attached to it. And this action is expressed in verse 15. Look at it with me. He says... I will most gladly spend and be spent for your souls. I love that expression. He's talking about currency, the currency in which Christians deal. The currency that we deal in is not the currency of physical money. The currency we deal with is time, effort, devotion, which leads to the procurement of souls by God. (laughs) Think about those words a moment. Jesus paid for these souls on the cross. This is the great news of the gospel. He was ransomed for us. And what it means to be ransomed is to make a payment in exchange for a life. The good news for you today is if you feel far from God, you need to know that Jesus was ransomed. He made payment for your life that you would be bought back to God and your sin would be forgiven. His life for ours. And now those who serve this Lord Jesus utilize this most profound currency to participate in a transaction of souls for God. And I can think of nothing more loving 
And nothing more generous than a person who chooses to spend and be spent for the souls of other people. Guys, that's what I'm trying to do with my life. That's what Christians have been trying to do with their lives for centuries. I'm trying to do that. It's certainly imperfect in its nature. I've been a pastor for 15 years in various roles. That's 5,475 days. (laughs) That is 780 Sundays spent for souls for other people. If the Lord allows me to serve him full time until I'm 70, I hope he allows longer than that. But if it's 70, that means that I have a lot more to spend and a lot more to be spent. (laughs) That's another 9,855 days. Another 1,404 Sundays with God's people. But here's the thing. You do not need to be in full-time ministry to spend and to be spent in service to God for the souls of other people. God is calling some of you in this room to serve him full-time vocationally, to change careers and devote all of your time and effort and energies to this type of service. But God is calling all of you every single one to spend and to be spent for other people. And so what does that look like practically when you have a lot of responsibilities in this life? When you have a job and you have children, you have a family to care for, when you have hobbies and activities that you want to engage in, what does it look like to spend and to be spent for the souls of other people? Well, to give your life for Christ and, by, and spend and be spent might appear initially to be a rather glorious endeavor to pour yourself out for other, others, to pay the ultimate price, maybe even to be martyred for the gospel, to go down in a blaze of glory. I will do that, a lot of people will say. I'm ready, Lord, send me wherever you want me to go. We think giving over our entire selves, spending it all for God is like taking a $1,000 bill, laying it on the table and saying, here's my life, God, I'm giving it all. But the reality is for most of us that he sends us to the bank, you cash in that $1,000 for a really big bag of quarters and you go through the rest of your life putting out 25 cents here (laughs) and 50 cents there and another quarter over here and a dollar there. You listen to the neighbor kid and his troubles and how he can't speak to his parents about them but he's willing to speak to you when you could say, get lost. Your problems aren't my problems. You invite your coworker to your growth group but not just invite them. You follow up with her regularly to see how she's doing and if she's understanding and growing in the things of God. You pray for the parents of your son's friends that you see at the soccer field and then you go through life looking for opportunities to inquire about something real, something important, something significant in that life. And then after you have that conversation, maybe you have a conversation about something even a little more significant, something spiritual. And then you hope for and you pray and you look for an opportunity to share the gospel of Jesus with them. And every step along the way, you're spending a quarter <laughs> and another quarter and another quarter and you are spending Spending and you're being spent for the soul of another person. You grow in your focus and your desire for others over and above your own comfort. And as you do that, you're spending and you're being spent for the gospel. Usually the Christian life is not the glorious life that you will see in a documentary 
It's done over all of these small and significant acts of love, 25 cents at a time. It would be easy to go out in a flash of glory. It's harder to live the Christian life little by little, day after day, quarter after quarter, for weeks, months, years, and decades. I'd gladly spend and be spent for your souls, Paul says. Authentic ministry occurs when a person spends and is spent for the souls of other people. That's what Christian ministry looks like, Christian to Christian, when you are willing to spend and be spent for the souls of others. Paul concludes the section by mentioning his ministry motives, not what is yours, but you, his ministry action to spend and be spent, and then he moves on to what his true ministry aspiration is. Look at it with me in verses 19 through 21. He says, have you been thinking all along that we've been defending ourselves to you? It is in the sight of God that we have been speaking in Christ all for your upbuilding, beloved. For I fear that perhaps when I come, I may find you not as I wish and you may find me not as you wish. That perhaps there may be quarreling or jealousy, anger, hostility, slander, gossip, conceit, and disorder. I fear that when I come again, my God may humble me before you that I may have to mourn over many of those who had sinned earlier and have not repented of the sexual impurity and immorality and sensuality that they have practiced. Paul is trying to smooth over any relational dynamics before he gets there. He doesn't want to get there and walk right into another fight. He wants the fighting to be over. And so he gives them this ministry aspiration. He says in verse 19, we've been speaking all of these things for, in Christ, for your upbuilding or for your building up. Now, sometimes when we think about building other people up, we think about it in a fairly flat way. We think about building each other up as simply communicating words of encouragement. And words of encouragement are really, really important. We know that to be true. They're incredibly powerful when they're spoken in sincerity and when they're spoken directly. After all, William Ward once said, flatter me and I may not believe you. Criticize me and I may not like you. Ignore me and I may not forgive you, but encourage me and I will not forget you. Encouragement is an important part of building other people up. But building other people up is more than just encouragement, especially as it relates to Christians. Because we see that as he mentions building others up, he immediately then writes of his fears that they had fallen back into all kinds of sins. And beyond that, they've not repented of impurity and sexual immorality and sensuality that they had previously practiced. Building up not only means encouraging someone, but it also, as a Christian, means coming alongside of them and helping them turn away from their sin because sin is that serious and back toward God in a relationship with him. To walk alongside of somebody and patiently engage them with the aim of them growing in faith and faithfulness. This is building each other up. Not in a condescending, judgmental addressing of sin, but to say, brothers and sisters, there is a better way. <laughs> There is a way for you and me to go forward in the fullness of joy that God gives. This is what it looks like when you spend and are spent for others. Authentic ministry occurs when a person spends and is spent for the souls of others. And so, what are you spending? and being spent on. I'm sure there's a variety of ways that you could answer that question. You could answer it in the context of time, relationships, your career, your family, your money, your activities. But here's the heart of it. What takes your greatest attention, 
your most sincere efforts? And how does that correspond to your actions? Most people have to work a full-time job and are still called to engage in this type of gospel work relationally. But their life's work is not the work of the job. (laughs) Their life's work is spending and being spent for souls in any context that that is. Today in our church, we have a business owner who at any moment would stop anything that he was doing to serve God by serving others, being spent for souls. He runs a successful business and has for a lot of years, but that's not what he's spending his life on. He's spending it on people. (laughs) One of my longtime friends is a great husband, medical doctor, father of four girls, upon engaging in a very hard conversation with me and another Christian brother many, many years ago in another context, talking to me about it afterward, I thanked him for his help, and he looked at me with a quizzical look and he said, this is my life's work. The other stuff I do just to make money and provide for my family. It was so simple and direct when he said it, and yet I was taken aback. It was just, it was clear, it was precise, and that always stuck with me. A guy in his 50s at the time, spending and being spent for the souls of others. What are you spending and being spent on? Over the years, I've had a number of conversations with people, specifically men, who have spent most of their life on something else. And something happens for many of them when they reach the age or right around the age of 60. They realize that they've made their money. They realize that they've had their career success. They realize their kids are off and out of the house. They've realized that they have that house paid for or close to it. And now they're looking at what could be the final third and they realized that they weren't spending on the things of the highest value. They were spending and being spent on something of subordinate worth. And they want to somehow change that. What are you spending and being spent on? There was a story of a young man who many years ago lay in his bed dying His mother believed him to be a Christian and was greatly surprised and distressed when one day she was passing his room and she heard him saying, lost, lost, lost. And immediately she threw the door open and cried, my boy, is it possible that you have lost your hope in Christ now that you're dying? No, mother, no, he replied. It is not that. I have a hope beyond the grave, but I have lost my life. 24 years I have lived and done nothing for the Son of God, and now I am going. My life has been spent for the self. I have lived for this world, and now while dying, I have given myself to Christ, but my life is lost. What are you spending and being spent on. You know, in the ancient days, when the king of Siam had an enemy that he wanted to torment and destroy, he would send that enemy a unique gift, a white elephant, a live albino white elephant. You won't think of your white elephant gift exchange at Christmas the same way next year. Because these animals were considered, obviously, to be extremely rare, and they were sacred in the culture of the day. And so the recipient of that elephant had no choice but to intentionally care for this incredibly valuable gift. But this elephant would take an inordinate amount of the enemy's time, resources, energy, emotions, and finances. And over time, the enemy would destroy himself because of the extremely burdensome process of caring for the white elephant. Our spiritual enemy uses the same strategy 
on you and on me. Let's say you buy season tickets to your favorite sports team, but because you still got a lot of games left in the season to go to, you no longer have time to serve in the area of ministry you were before. Or let's say that you buy a summer cottage, but now you miss most weekend worship services with your brothers and sisters between the beginning of May and the end of September. Or let's say you buy a health club membership, a good thing to do to get in shape. You used to get up early in the morning to read your Bible and pray, but now you don't have time because you go to work out before you go to work. Or let's say that you help your child get onto one of the traveling sports teams in our community, and now you're too busy to join a growth group or to grow in community with other people. Are there white elephants in your life? Are you spending your time or efforts or money on the things that take your time away from spending them on the most valuable? Because the money isn't really the problem. The activities aren't necessarily bad or the problem. The problem is a white elephant gift that pulls you away from God-honoring pursuits. So what are you spending and being spent on? Paul says authentic ministry occurs when a person spends and is spent for souls, <laughs> the souls of other people. Let's pray. Father, I want my life to be expended on the thing of the greatest consequence. I know that there are so many here this morning that want the same thing, that we're tempted by the white elephants in our life, that we can't see necessarily very clearly how to spend and be spent the souls of others. God, we pray today that you would help us, that you would help us to reorient our perspective on that of greatest value, that you would help us to reorient our resources, that you would forgive us of our constant pursuit of comfort, that you would help us to have an internal burden and fire to be used for the greatest things, the greatest glory, the greatest consequence, and that many, many more would be brought into heaven as a result. In Jesus' name. Amen.